Chapter 85, M. Mission Start Once Nightlight and Twilight Velvet were caught up with the story, Samus and Spike continued the tale. The trip to the system's management room was rather uneventful, Samus explained. There were a few biological threats which, for some reason, were now more hostile to us than before. Spike's aggression wasn't enough to make them retreat anymore. And for some reason, they didn't taste good anymore, either, Spike complained. Not fun. He decided to ignore the giggles from most present, though he noticed his grandparents looking a bit sick. Grandma, Grandpa, I'm an apex predator. He opened his mouth to reveal razor sharp incisors in the front and saw like molars in back. He pointed to the molars. These are the only ones meant for eating gems, and most of that gets done in the stomach. He then pointed to the incisors. And these are not for vegetables. We know that, Spike. Nightlight replied. It's just. It's one thing to know your grandson is built to eat other creatures, Velvet explained. Quite another to wrap your head around him writing the Gourmet Predator's Guide to the Galaxy. That's actually still the fifth bestseller, last time I checked, Anthony pointed out good-naturedly. Twilight gasped eagerly. You wrote a book Spike? Why didn't you tell me? When can I get a copy for the shelves? When do I get to read it? Several laughs and rolled eyes greeted Twilight's enthusiasm, but it managed to smooth over the tension Spike's new eating habits had raised ever so briefly. Samus then continued speaking. As it turned out, the circuitry in the system's management room was loaded with insect hives, she explained. When we tried to turn the machines back on, the insects came out to defend their hives against the electricity. While I kept them back with my power beam, Spike used his flame breath in a wave to cook the hives out. Using it as a beam there would have melted the circuitry, Spike explained. Took longer that way, but did less damage. Once the hives were gone, we turned the machines back on, Samus concluded. With the systems back online, I had a bit more access to the station's controls, Adam explained. However, as this did nothing to clear up the communications block, I sent Samus and Spike to assist one of my men in Sector 1. He went to investigate a facility of interest there, so I instructed Samus and Spike to survey the area, to try and determine the purpose of the station, since we didn't even know that yet. Did you tell Samus that's what you wanted her to do? Luna asked curiously. No, Adam replied curtly. Samus and Spike had proven themselves supremely effective at handling situations with minimal instructions. I was counting on those abilities and perceptions to discover more about the situation without putting the artificial filter of my expectations over their senses. And how did that go? Luna inquired, glancing over at Samus and Spike. Samus glanced away while Spike shrugged. Took a while to figure out what we were looking for, Spike explained. Unfortunately, the outcome from that wasn't, entirely pleasant. He shrugged slightly. Although the journey itself wasn't entirely unpleasant. Sector 1 was dubbed the Biosphere, and for good reason. Nearly every subdivided chamber in the sector was nearly overgrown with wild, out of control plant life and various animals, and sometimes the plants were the more dangerous, as several actively tried to eat the hunter pair. This was nothing new for Samus or Spike after Talon 4, so they dealt with it in the manner that had been most effective back there set everything in sight on fire and pick their way through the wreckage. The first major animal challenge they faced was a large lizard-like creature that had the ability to cloak itself, rendering it invisible. While Samus had difficulty tracking the creature as a result, Spike did not, since the light bending ability did nothing to cloak its scent. The long tail it used to lash at the pair lost much of its effectiveness after Spike had bit off the last three feet of it. Before long the pair came to a centralized chamber that went up and down through a good portion of the biosphere that had become completely overgrown by a massive tree-like plant structure made up of several intertwined trunks. Making their way up the winding path around it, they made their way to the next navigation room. The two continued the winding path through the overgrown hallways of the biosphere, moving from navigation room to navigation room as Adam directed, sending them map data as it became available. Spike was forced to use the shape slash size changing abilities he got from Gandrita a great deal more than ever before, as many of the paths they had to take were through what Samus thought of as morph ball tunnels, which were too small for Spike unless he shrank down. Thankfully, 
no matter what size he became he was able to adjust himself for flight. The most concerning part for Samus and Spike was when they encountered a chamber the map labeled as a breeding room, filled with plants, heating lamps, and another dead scientist. Unlike the previous one, which had been torn apart by something large, the wound showed the attack pattern of a tiny but vicious and deadly creature. As Samus examined the corpse, she shot to her feet, hand on her arm cannon. She felt, something. An evil, familiar presence she couldn't quite place. She could tell that Spike was much the same, as his claws lengthened of their own accord in response to a growl from deep in his throat. Making their way back from the breeding room, they returned to a plant-filled chamber only to freeze as they heard a sound in the bushes. Both spun, weapons primed and ready to unleash devastation on whatever evil creature had come after them. Only to see a tiny white bird-like creature, with stick legs, trying and failing to crack open a fruit, actually managing to fall over helplessly onto its back as it tried to rotate the fruit for a better angle. Spike and Samus both tried to keep their defenses up, but it was just so small, so helpless looking, so fluffy. Chapter 86, M, Keep Him Out of the Light Ah! Fluttershy squealed happily as she and everyone else stared at the picture Samus provided of the little birdie. Ridley was so cute as an infant. All faces around the table spun to her, most in confusion before completely stunned. How do you know that was Ridley? Samus demanded. Fluttershy blinked in surprise. You mean I was right? She asked, shocked. It's just, I used to play video games with Rainbow Dash when we were younger up in Cloudsdale, and thinking of it in terms of video games with what you said about how Ridley somehow got cloned from cells on your suit at the bottle ship and all that, I just thought about what Rainbow would call the worst, most obvious, most irritating twist that couldn't even be called that that could come out of bad writing. She blushed. Not that it's your fault this would qualify as that, you just lived through it after all, I'm sorry. Weeping quietly, Fluttershy hid behind her mane. Wait. Rainbow spoke up. You mean that's really Ridley? She demanded, pointing at the picture. When she got a confirming nod, she rolled her eyes. Great. He seemed like a big bad before now, but now I've lost all respect for him. How can anything so evil be so, tiny? Rarity demanded, stunned. Paris sprites, Twilight reminded her. Rarity thought about that, then shrugged. Fair enough. How does he survive like that, anyway? Scootaloo demanded. Act super cute around anything bigger than him so they'll baby him until he's eaten enough to become a monster. Basically, yeah, Spike agreed. Not that uncommon a survival trait, actually. Pinkie Pie suddenly burst out laughing. You're telling me Ridley's a gremlin? She gasped out. As everyone burst out laughing at that, revealing that some things show up no matter how the culture develops, Samus could only shrug, gasping out. Basically. As laughter surrounded the table, Shining Armor spoke up through his gasps. Don't get your Ridley wet. And don't feed him after midnight, Anthony agreed, extending his clenched fist to bump with Shining's hoof. Even Adam managed to chuckle or two. The Mogwai called, they want their stick back. At that size, Ridley doesn't have one, Spike gasped out, startling even more laughter. Amidst the amusement, Luna the only one not laughing, leaned towards her sister. I don't get it, she whispered. Celestia stifled her own giggles. I'll show you the film another time, she promised. Once the laughter died down, Samus got back to the business at hand. Yes, that was Ridley, though we didn't realize it at the time, she confirmed. Even Spike didn't recognize him, though somehow, I think he recognized us. As soon as he caught sight of us watching him, he raced away into the bushes. Before we could go investigate, Adam managed to unlock another door for us and ordered us through to continue our investigation of the biodome, Spike added. But when we went to continue, he was watching us. It was, unsettling, to say the least, Samus admitted, but Adam locked the hatch behind us, so we weren't too worried at the time. More relaxed, she continued the tale. The next few areas seemed to be much more expansive but we quickly discovered that much of it was holographic backdrops. That frustrated Spike more than me, I'll admit. You try flying into an expansive sky, 
only to bang your beak against a wall you couldn't see, Spike snapped back, causing more stifled giggles, save from Rainbow, Celestia, and Luna, who all wrinkled their muzzles sympathetically. Despite those hurdles, Samus continued, things were more or less smooth sailing for us until we reached the subterranean control room. At first, it seemed like we'd just have to fight some more cloaking lizards, but once we got past the navigation room. As the pair of hunters entered the next chamber, two floating mechanical drones descended from the ceiling to confront them. At first it seemed they would be easy enough to deal with, but they were rather more heavily armored than they first appeared. Samus beam weapons and missiles bounced right off the drones, as did Spike's beam focused breath weapons, and they moved too fast for Spike to get a good grip on. After a time, however, the drones pulled some of their armor back, revealing energy projection points. On an impulse, Samus tried firing there, and found that part could be damaged. With that discovery, the fight was quick and brutal, as they each took one drone. When Spike dealt with his first one, a third one dropped down, which he dealt with in much the same way. When all three were destroyed, a strange device remained. Samus went to collect it, and found it absorbed into her suit, her arm cannon registering a new function. Diffusion beam acquired. Charged beam blast will scatter after impact. And here I was beginning to think you wouldn't get anything new this time around, Rainbow chuckled, rubbing her hooves together. What with you coming in with a full arsenal? Samus smirked at that. Well, it was one of the few, she admitted. Still quite useful against large groups. Nearly as effective as Spike spraying his different breath weapons. She frowned. Of course, on our way out. As the pair moved to leave the subterranean control room, a large worm with a mouth full of sharp teeth, which they'd encountered once in some underground tunnels, burst through the metal walls, roaring. Another worm head, whether another worm or its other end was difficult to determine, burst through nearby. Samus and Spike both prepared for battle as the worm ends began firing electrical energy at them in concentrated spheres. While Spike drew their fire, Samus locked on and fired a missile after the energy was released, forcing each worm out of the walls. Spike then followed up by slamming into the worms to down them, allowing Samus to finish them off with a diffusion blast straight down their throats. With both worms taken down the same way, the path was cleared for the pair to continue onward returning to where the controls inside had opened a path at another navigation room. Chapter 87, M, Dangerous Creatures From the sound of it, the Bottleship mission didn't really have anything of big interest for rather large gaps, Twilight mused as Samus paused in her tail. Why is that? Samus shrugged. We were going up against creatures of the sort we'd faced hundreds of times before, on an enclosed station, and Spike still had all his abilities. Even with some of the abilities of the creatures which seemed designed with countering his abilities in mind, which, in hindsight, really should have rung a few alarm bells, we had no trouble coasting through for most of it. Not to mention if things really got tough, I could always reactivate more of my abilities. Assuming you got permission, Spike grumbled, turning a glare towards Adam, who ignored it. At any rate, Samus continued quickly. It wasn't long after the worm that we encountered another unusual hurdle, a large hive of insectoid creatures that proved more difficult to take down. It also happened to be the first step towards a rather, rough reunion. Samus and Spike scanned their surroundings after sliding down the long tube. They found themselves in a large chamber with beetle-like creatures scuttling around a good distance away. Nothing seemed all that interested in attacking them, until something let out a loud, piercing, almost human shriek. All the beetles rose up on their abdomens and turned to attack the pair even as several large insectoids resembling dragonflies began to dive bomb them. Spike and Samus did their best to evade, countering with the diffusion beam and Spike's various breath weapons, along with striking physically when the enemies grew too close. They continued to blast away at the creatures that attacked, but the creatures continued to drop out of a large structure above them, the very structure they'd slid through to reach the chamber. After a time, Five blooms on the branches holding the hive up open, projecting energy towards the pair. Acting on experience and practice working together, each of them took on one, Spike using his claws to tear his bloom to shreds, Samus destroying hers with a missile. The branches broke apart into bits from the destruction, and the remaining two blooms closed up, 
and more dragonfly-like insectoids descended, and ones without wings crawled up out of the ground to attack as well. The pattern repeated, but working together they were able to take out the fifth bloom before it could close, Samus targeting the bloom while Spike kept the insects that attacked at bay. With that, the hive fell to the ground and broke open, revealing the queen creature embedded in the hive structure, and a mess of their honey. Several creatures tried to protect the queen, but Samus and Spike were too thorough, and before long all were dead. The hive turned black, and the few surviving creatures fled. A loud growling echoed nearby. The little birdie could be seen, eagerly devouring the honey from a hive piece with a long wet tongue that gleamed blood red, and tearing the hive chunk to bits with sharp teeth. Seeing its voracity, it was no longer cute, and Samus felt sick at the way the creature fed off her power like that, using her and Spike to get at the food they needed. Spike snarled his own distaste, spitting a bit of fire at the creature out of spite, but it dodged to the side, hissing at him before returning to its grisly feast. Ridley was the source of the shriek, wasn't he? Fluttershy asked softly. He did that to make you fight the insect so he could get the honey? Yeah, that's right, Samus confirmed. It's what he needed to jumpstart his metamorphosis to his next stage, though we didn't discover that until later. At that point I directed them to the biosphere test area in that sector, Adam spoke up. A rendezvous with the whole unit was planned at the exam center there, as it held important information about the bottle ship. But the trip there wasn't as smooth as it could have been, Spike added. I still don't understand why you didn't approve the gravity suit for when we had to go into the water. Because every approved piece of equipment meant more attention drawn to Samus, Adam explained. The more of her tech was active, the stronger her communication signal became, and the easier it was for whoever else was on the station to track you both down. Besides, you can swim. It's not like she needed the gravity suit to maneuver underwater as long as you were there. Spike blinked, shocked. You already thought someone or something on the station was trying to kill us at that point? When on a mission, I always assume that someone or something from an unexpected direction is trying to kill me and the men and women under my command, Adam countered. Which is why before that mission, our unit at such a low casualty rate, Anthony added with a smirk. And if I'd gotten a bit more information sooner, I could have saved everyone there, too, Adam stated curtly, not meeting anyone's eyes. Silence greeted that statement at first. Then Celestia quietly set her teacup down. Commander, she said softly, I think, when next we take a break from this story, you should join my sister, my former student, and I for some tea. Adam frowned. I'm not so sure. I've long been of the opinion that lessons were best learned through experiencing them, she continued, but you have brought to my attention that, sometimes, this method can be, unnecessarily cruel. As Twilight is now a princess, she is also a leader of our little ponies, and she has already proven herself time and again on the field of battle. However, I'm sure you know as well as I that sometimes, a leader will lose some of those who look to them for guidance. She smiled beatifically at him. I thought it might be good if my sister and I passed on the lessons we've learned for dealing with such things, especially ways to handle the guilt, before she needed them. Perhaps you'd care to listen in? If only for cultural comparisons? Adam was silent for a time, but eventually nodded, taking a sip of his tea. He seemed, far less tense than before. Chapter 88, M, Baneful Beasts Once the tension in the room faded, Samus decided to continue the story. Of course, some of the creatures we faced were larger and more difficult to deal with than others, she explained. Although the largest ones in Sector 1 were easy to deal with, for the simple reason that they tended to show up in the largest areas. After making their way through a long, winding path of gratings through the large forested chamber they were within, Samus was finally able to turn off the hollow projector to see the path they needed in order to move forward. With the holograms off, the sky-filled backdrop and many of the larger trees vanished, revealing metal walls and metallic structures. One of the larger trees, however, unfolded angrily, revealing what looked like a brachiosaur made of wood. Like a dinosaur version of a timber wolf? Twilight gasped out eagerly, pulling out a book to show an image of the creature she was describing. Samus stared at the image for a time, then chuckled. More or less, yes, she admitted. 
its long neck stretched out on its low slung body, its massive tree trunk legs stomping along like a spider with two missing legs. Its rather obvious weak point was a large orange sphere on its undercarriage, pulsing with light. Samus readied her arm cannon to lunge in for battle, only for Spike to lunge past her, expanding in size until he matched the creature, bowling it over with sheer bulk to attack the orange sphere. Samus stepped back, thinking Spike had it all under control until the creature reversed its limbs, standing upright with the orange sphere high above, now walking more like a giraffe. Spike, for his part, leapt into the air, shrinking back down to human size as he landed on the creature's back and hitting the orange sphere with his flame breath. The fire spread, and the entire creature collapsed, smoldering. Yeah, probably should have realized what plus fire equals dead a bit sooner, Spike admitted, causing a few titters. It wasn't all as fun as that, though, Samus admitted. Not long after that, we reached the test area Adam sent us to. Her voice trailed off. That's when things started going wrong. As they reached the entrance to the exam center's control chamber, they found the door damaged and forced open. Samus and Spike immediately went on the defensive. They carefully made their way in through the door. When they entered, they found one of the members of Adam's unit already there, working on the computers. As he got up, the rest of the unit arrived, minus one. Where's Lyle? The one from the computers asked. Looks like he's late, Anthony offered with a shrug. Another one of the troopers began working on the computers, but the information was fragmented. Apparently, the CPU had self-destructed, and it would take a while for him to piece anything useful together. Anthony took charge of the situation, ordering everyone else to search the building while their computer expert worked on recovering the data. After a brief bout of shared nostalgia between Anthony and Samus, everyone began to search. During her search, however, Samus stumbled across a Zebzian, one of the creatures native to Zebes, that had been cybernetically enhanced to resemble the space pirates, with Galactic Federation tech. What? Twilight wasn't the only one shocked by this revelation. Before Samus could respond, Adam took over the explanation. It wasn't clear at the time, Adam began, but the bottle ship was the work of certain branches of the military to create an ideal assault force based around the space pirates, since that force was no longer an issue. The idea behind it was that, since they'd proven so effective against us, creating such a force to work for us would provide an ideal force to be reckoned with. And the idea that they might go rogue and become the pirates all over again never occurred to the big wigs? Applejack demanded snidely. That's why my report on the matter said it was folly to attempt, Adam grumbled. Unfortunately, someone went through with it anyway, basing the whole thing on that report, which made it easy for certain parties to point the blame my way at just the right time. Not that it did any good, Spike countered. He tapped his muzzle. Takes a lot to fool this nose. I just wish I'd had access to it sooner. Adam muttered. The single file recovered from the computer revealed that the bottle ship was a bioweapons research platform, a highly illegal one at that, under the supervision of a Dr. Madeline Bergman. With nothing else forthcoming, Anthony gave orders to have the two computer experts stay and try and get more information, while the rest of them searched the area for the missing doctor. During the search, Samus and Spike came across a few of the augmented Zebzians that had become active somehow, and moved to attack them. As they moved with the same coordination that Space Pirates did, Adam ordered the troops back in for Samus and Spike to take care of them. Spike quickly found that the cybernetic augmentations made the Zebzians taste terrible, and focused on combat that didn't involve biting. Despite the bite damage, that enemy kept charging in apparently not phased by its partially crushed torso and skull. The augmented Zebzians proved to be far more athletic and maneuverable than the space pirates had ever been, even managing to evade Samus and Spike's attacks at times. However, as there were only six of them, eventually they were taken down by a mix of assault techniques, allowing the pair to go meet up with the others. However, when they made it to the control center, they saw the others under attack by a large purple creature with white bristly hair on its back between body spikes, an alligator-like jaw surmounted by a long, red tongue. Its long tail ended in a sharp spine. As it roared, it looked up and spotted Samus and Spike through the window. We need to get out to them, fast! 
Samus barked out, rushing for the door, only to be grabbed by Spike. Right! He growled, smashing his way through the reinforced glass, coming down on top of the creature with Samus in tow. The creature let off the same almost human shriek that had sent the insectoids from before into a frenzy, and dozens of other creatures erupted out of the ground to attack. As Samus moved to back up the other troops, Spike and the creature circled each other. The creature gazed balefully at Spike, its eyes filled with an unnatural level of hatred. Spike snarled defiance, clashing with the creature with teeth and claws, the battle driving back and forth across the landscape. At one point, Spike attempted to leap into the air for an advantage, only for the creature's tail to pierce his wing. Screaming in pain, Spike fell to the ground. Spike! Samus called out, rushing forward. As the creature leapt to pin Spike and press its advantage, a highly charged burst of plasma seared its shoulder, a last minute twist being all that prevented it from losing the limb. As Anthony charged his heavy plasma cannon for a second shot, it raced away, leaping through the walls of the large open area hidden by holograms to escape. Grumbling, Anthony disengaged the heavy plasma cannon, letting it recharge. At that point, the other attacking creatures had dispersed. You okay there, ankle biter? He called out. It got you good! Spike shrugged, swallowing one of the creatures that had gotten a bit too close to him. It'll heal, he replied, wincing as the membrane already began to knit. Hey! One of the others called out. Get over here! Samus paused by Spike to check on his injury, that was already fully healed, before joining the others, where they found the body of the missing Lyle, torn to shreds. Looks like an animal attack, Samus muttered. Animals don't use Federation issue blasters, Spike muttered. He stinks of the ozone tang of blaster burns. Someone, or something, shot him dead, and something else came and cleaned up the job. As everyone glanced nervously at each other, Anthony spoke up. What do you mean, something? I'm also smelling, something a lot like gore, Spike muttered. And, a bit of the electrical tang from Gandrata's camouflage abilities. While everyone was talking, Samus had followed a trail of green blood, to the body of the little birdie, an empty husk split down the middle like a pupa that had cracked open. So, I get that Gecko Ridley broke out of Bird Ridley, Rainbow spoke up. But what was that about Gore and Gandrita? I was able to piece the details together, Adam explained. The Federation had taken the studies of Gore and Gandrita post-phase and exposure, and used it to create a new type of soldier, androids that could make themselves look human with energy-based cloaks. The Federation usurped my body's design? Gore demanded angrily. How dare they warp my creations? You mean, they used me to make weapons? Gandrita gasped out. He gasped. Yes, Adam confirmed. And, one such weapon was stowed on our ship on the way to the battleship, meant to keep us from learning too much. He ground his teeth. The idea of such technological weapons was another I suggested. Using technology to create soldiers that can fight instead of people, to reduce the waste of life. If I'd known one was already completed, I'd have made sure everyone traveled in pairs to be sure no one could be caught by such a troop unawares if one were a present hostile. As it was. Silence reigned. Chapter 89, M, Hot Under the Collar. So you just learned you had a Terminator on the loose out to kill you all, Discord commented dryly as he floated over Adam. What brilliant strategic decision did you make in response? I sent Samus and Spike after the creature that had attacked the group, made sure everyone was in pairs and authorized one electric base weapon for each team with orders to shoot anyone they encountered with the stun setting, Adam replied. If it were our own men, Samus, or Spike, it would cause a momentary paralysis. To the android trying to kill us, it would cause internal shorts in the disengaging of the cloak, at which point everyone was authorized to terminate it. Spike got the same instructions regarding his electric breath, since having him do so meant keeping more of Samus tech inactive and allowing them both to stay as incognito as possible. Discord stared at Adam for a time, then huffed to himself. Fine. He pouted, floating back over to Fluttershy. Ruin my sarcasm! A wave of titters and giggles made Discord grin, 
as his brilliant plan to defuse the negative emotional energy had proven completely successful. Samus picked up the tail where it was left off. Pursuing the creature took us into Sector 3, the Pyrosphere, she explained. This sector was very similar to Norfair, with many rocky passages, and superheated chambers filled with artificial lava. So you activated your Varya suit? Twilight asked curiously. Not at first, Samus admitted. The original orders were to explore the areas I could access safely without it. My normal power suit can handle superheated areas for a while, so I planned on rushing through any such area I came across. I felt I could handle it. I felt mom was putting herself in enough danger using a limited arsenal without letting the environment kill her, too, Spike grumbled. I had it out with Adam about that at the first navigation room before we entered a superheated section unprotected. In my defense, Samus knew her capabilities at that point better than I did, Adam replied. I assumed if she felt the area put her in too much danger from the temperature, she would request authorization of the Varia suit immediately, since we were in constant communication. Spike snorted. That's not what you said when I confronted you about it. As Samus stepped towards the door and the superheated air started to work its way through her power suit, Spike yanked her back in before accessing the navigation booth. Adam, I've got a bone to pick with you. Make it quick, Adam countered. We have a large scale operation going on here. And mom's about to go into an artificial active volcano. Spike growled. This wouldn't be that big of a deal except, oh, I don't know, you haven't authorized her use of the Varia suit. I'm certain you have your reasons for not authorizing everything right away, to be honest, I'm used to mom having an incomplete arsenal in these missions. Hey, Samus snapped, punching him on the shoulder. But to have protection from this environment and not use it is just stupid, Spike concluded. Can you give me one good reason why she should risk a lethal dose of heat stroke to get through there? Adam was silent for a time. Samus, use of Varia suit is authorized. Nodding, Samus activated her Varya suit. Understood Adam. As is the use of your common sense and sound judgment to request the authorization of tech on an any basis, Adam continued. That's something I didn't think I had to authorize. Sneering under her helmet, Samus gave Adam a very different salute from normal, making Spike chuckle. Luna snorted into her cocoa as she chuckled at that. Did you seriously have to say that? She asked Adam. I don't normally have to authorize my men to tie their shoes, Adam replied, earning himself a punch on either arm from Samus and Anthony. Hey, you knew Samus was all mixed up over working for you again, Anthony insisted. You could have cut her a little slack. And make her even more confused? Adam countered. You want a punch from me? Spike suggested. Only if you shrink first. If you three can stop the dick measuring contest? Samus demanded. Pretty sure Spike wins anyway, with or without size changing. He does have to, Gandreda spoke up. Everyone turned to stare at her. How, do you know that? Samus asked worriedly. I turned into him once while trying to figure out how to woo him more successfully, Gandreda offered easily. I thought seeing things from his perspective might help. Pinky leaned over to Discord. I'm not sure. But does that still qualify as creepy? Considering she was likely still a minor at the time, I'd say more awkwardly adorable, Discord whispered back. Um, if Spike can reshape himself, doesn't that mean he can have as many as he wants? Fluttershy offered nervously. Noticing every face at the table pointed at her, she let out a quiet meep and hid under the table. Anthony let out a low whistle. Always the quiet ones, he murmured appreciatively. After a time, Applejack spoke up, quickly covering Apple Bloom's mouth before she could ask embarrassing questions about the present subject matter. So, did you get your ice beam authorized? Figure it's a good weapon if you're in a fireplace, right? Considering many of the enemies were on fire, yes, Sam is confirmed, eager for anything to change the subject. They tasted spicy. Spike offered readily. Chapter 90, M fire and ice. So I take it your ice beam and Spike's ice breath saw a lot of use in the Pyrosphere? Twilight asked curiously. 
It certainly did, Samus confirmed, glad to be past the more awkward topics from before. Nearly every monster we encountered went down quickly under concentrated ice-based attacks. The only problem was that they exploded, rather than froze most times, Spike grumbled. Didn't get much to eat as we went through. He rolled his eyes at the knowing chuckles. Anything interesting happen while you were there? Luna asked curiously. Well, not until the floor observation room. Samus began. As Samus and Spike entered the large observation room, latent instincts caused both to dive to either side as a large, armored creature that somewhat resembled a beetle skittered across the floor towards them, nearly running them over. As they came to a stop, it stood up on heavily armored legs and extended large metal pincers on arms before turning to fight the pair. Its preferred method of fighting was to dash around flat against the ground, where its metal body deflected all beam and missile weapons, while launching smaller versions of itself that lacked its defensive capabilities at the attacking pair. While these smaller versions were easy to destroy, they also moved fast and exploded if they got too close. After destroying enough of the smaller ones, the larger one tried a different tack, extending its pincers and head on a long neck to aim his attack. The fleshy neck was more vulnerable than the metal body, allowing Samus and Spike to attack and inflict damage. Spike tried flipping it onto its back at one point, but not only was the underside armored but that allowed it to bring blades and clawed legs into the fray if Spike or Samus stayed too close, and it was easily able to flip itself back over. Admittedly, there was a weak point in the center of its underbelly, a spot that glowed red when it charged energy for an assault. Eventually, the pair managed to develop a strategy to take it down. Spike tackled the creature to the wall, holding its legs and pincers at bay and snapping at the angry head. Samus then ducked in as it tried to charge energy to break free, blasting away at the weak point. It managed to break free, but it was staggered. Samus then lunged in, grabbed hold of the head, and pulled out what turned out to be a worm that had been controlling an armored battle body. The worm lunged for her, but Spike seized it and dug in, tearing away at the flesh with claws and teeth as he devoured it. Samus stood back to let him finish his meal. So how is it? She asked as he licked his lips. Tastes kinda like a hot dog, Spike replied. Or maybe an undercooked sausage. If it tasted undercooked, why didn't you roast it with your flame breath? Pinky asked curiously, startling a few laughs. Too hungry, Spike countered, startling more laughter. Rolling her eyes, Samus continued the tale. Not far beyond that, the pyrosphere actually had an artificial volcano. Twilight's eyes widened. That's fascinating, she gasped eagerly. How did they manage it? No clue, Samus, Spike, Adam, and Anthony responded in unison making Twilight pout. I have a few ideas how they could have managed such a feat, Gore offered. Once we have reached the end of the story of this mission, I will happily share those ideas with you. Twilight grinned eagerly. Chuckling indulgently, Spike took up the tale. Of course, the volcano made things interesting since we had to go towards it, while dodging the lava bombs it launched. Once we were past that, we encountered a few more enhanced Zeebzeans. The diffusion slash ice beam combination created a rather interesting effect, since it froze over their blasters, making them much easier to take down. Still miss that beam mod, Samus grumbled to herself. I'm sorry we weren't able to properly correct the coding, Gore offered apologetically. We were a trifle pressed for time at that point, and it was the most complicated beam. Not your fault, Gore, Samus hastened to assure him. What you did was more than enough. Um? Shining voiced in confusion. Something from the next mission, Adam explained. We'll get to that. Besides, Spike continued, what happened next was really fun. As Spike and Samus dropped down into the volcanic crater's interior, the magma level slowly began to rise towards them. Samus quickly looked around, seeing a winding path around the crater interior leading upwards, which would involve a lot of carefully timed jumps, ducks, bobbing and leaving all while racing at top speed to outrun the rising lava. She then considered her alternative, riding her winged dragon sun up to the top on the sweetest thermal ever. She took a few moments to carefully consider which would be more fun before leaping onto Spike's back as he spread his wings. Twilight could only roll her eyes as Rainbow, 
Scootaloo, Pinkie Pie, and Luna burst into laughter before exchanging hoof bumps with Samus. Of course that was the deciding factor. She grumbled. What else would be? Samus asked before getting back into the tail. With Samus on his back, Spike shot up through the volcano, briefly dodging a massive red tinder that tried to sweep him out of the air. The pair blasted out the top of the mountain like a cannon, shortly followed by a flood of magma. As the caldera overflowed, a massive red creature erupted out of the magma. It had a long, thin neck with tendrils waving out the sides, a massive pair of tentacles ending in malformed hands, and a glowing red spot on its neck. Its head was rather simplistic, with only a few fins and a tooth-filled maw as distinguishing features. It would likely have proved a serious challenge had they attacked it from the ground. So Spike attacked it from the air, freezing the neck so Samus could snipe the frozen section with missiles. Its only ranged attack involved hurling chunks of lava at them, which Spike was easily able to evade. Once it took enough damage, the glowing point faded. With no other weak point readily available, Spike started dive bombing the head, digging into the crown with claws before pulling away and letting Samus hit the open wound with charged blasts. A few of those runs, and the creature began exploding, its structure strained to the breaking point. With its destruction, the magma level lowered. Apparently, the creature was controlling the volcano somehow, Samus explained. With it destroyed, the place became much safer to navigate. Chapter 91, M, Lava and Levum. How come they even had a critter like that in the first place? Applejack demanded. Probably as a possible bio-weapon, Samus posited. Pretty sure everything in there was meant to be a bio-weapon of one sort or another. Well, if that creature was controlling the lava, does that mean killing it made the lava tamer elsewhere? Rainbow asked curiously. Indeed it did, Spike confirmed. That allowed us to explore more of the pyrosphere. He rolled his eyes to glare at Adam. But before we managed to get very far at all, we got sent to Sector 2. I hadn't gotten a status report from my men in that sector in a worrying amount of time, Adam replied. You were the only ones I could contact immediately to send. Not to mention the men there were searching for survivors. Reasonable, if no less irritating, Samus admitted. Even if it did give Ridley more time to regain strength. So what was Sector 2 like? Twilight asked, hoping to defuse any argument or debate. Spike shrugged. Not sure what it was supposed to be, but an irregularity in the climate control system rendered the entire sector frozen over, and all the creatures we encountered were adapted to the cold. Velvet chuckled. And thus, not to a fire-breathing dragon, she teased her grandson. Bet that made things easier. It certainly did, Grandma, Spike agreed made a lot of it real smooth sailing. Even the larger animals went down quickly from the blast of my fire. Of course, then we found more augmented Zebzians, Samus grumbled. These with reverse engineered and augmented space pirate battle tech. Not fun. Yeah, Spike grumbled. It was like fighting space pirates all over again. You did rather well, Adam commented. Plenty of practice, Samus grumbled. And the impression wasn't helped when we found creature corpses that showed signs of metroid predation in the supercold segment, Spike continued. Not a pleasant experience, especially when we later learned that it was metroids genetically modified to stand cold. Given the situation, I authorized the use of Samus Speed Booster, Adam explained. Of the tech she had available, it had the highest versatility slash signal ratio making it the most logical choice to increase her options without putting her in excess danger from the killer android we now knew was after the whole team. I suppose it was helpful, Samus admitted. So, did you find the other troops? Sweetie Belle asked curiously. Or survivors? Apple Bloom added. Or the killer android? Scootaloo squealed. Samus and Spike fell silent. Spike was the first to speak up at long last. Yes. Unfortunately, Samus added. As Samus and Spike raced towards another facility deep in the snowdrifts, they skidded to a halt as they found the body of another of Adam's men. His body was severely chilled, looking to have been finished off with a freeze round. As they stared, they felt someone watching. 
Both of them spun towards the building, spotting a blonde-haired woman in a lab coat staring at them through the window. When she caught them looking at her, she gasped and dashed away into the facility. The pair immediately detoured into the facility, which turned out to be a material storehouse filled with various containers. Samus moved amongst the maze of containers, following the woman as she caught sight of her. Spike made his way over the containers, ready to flank just in case this figure turned out to be the killer android that was taking out their allies. As they got closer, the woman shouted out, Don't come near me! Samus immediately stopped. This was either the killer android pretending to be a helpless scientist to lull her into a false sense of security, or one of scientists scared out of her wits. She decided that, either way, a cautious approach was warranted. She began to move forward slowly. I know why you're here! The woman shouted again, anger mixed with fear. You're mistaken, Samus offered comfortingly. I'm here to rescue you! You're lying! The woman shouted back. I know the Galactic Federation wants to silence everyone who knows about our work here yeah! Spike had taken the opportunity to drop down behind the woman. Then it's a good thing we're freelance, he stated calmly. The mission objective we were given was to secure the safety of any and all survivors. The woman staggered backwards fearfully, but then tensed herself. How can I trust you and your troops? Are being killed off by a hunter-killer android disguised as a Federation trooper sent along specifically because the Federation knew they couldn't flip anyone in the unit that was sent to respond to the distress signal? Samus asked, catching up. Yeah, I can see why you might have a problem taking our word for it. The woman staggered back worriedly. At that moment, a large mecha, by appearance, likely designed for moving the crates around, activated and began to attack sending one of the large crates tumbling straight towards the woman. Acting quickly, Spike grabbed her and leapt to the ceiling, taking her to a safe distance and leaving Samus to combat the mecha, and its unidentifiable pilot in what looked like the armor the Federation troops were wearing. Samus tensed up as she saw this. Apparently, the deleter android was making its move. Charging her arm cannon, Samus prepared for combat. Spike! She ordered. Do not come to my assist! Protect the civilian! Understood, Mom! Spike replied quickly. Chapter 92, M, Cold Hearted The mecha was large and bulky, but still able to move quite fast in a charge. Thankfully, it took some time after each charge before it could reorient for another charge. The engine block was mounted on the back, so after Samus evaded the first charge, she was able to fire several charged diffusion slash ice blasts to the engine, inflicting damage and eventually freezing the joint of the right manipulator arm. One missile shattered the joint, letting the limb fall to the ground and break apart. The mech attempted to fight back with laser blasts and other weapons, but Samus had too much practice against mechas to fail so easily. It wasn't long before she was able to take out the second manipulator arm. At that point, the mecha deployed bus saw blades around its treads, attempting to shred Samus as it charged back and forth. Spike, watching from a safe distance, rolled his eyes. This is getting ridiculous, he grumbled, gathering energy into his mouth. Stay behind me! Nodding fearfully, the woman he was ordered to guard clung to his back near the base of his tail, below his wings. This nailed down to her even further that they were, in fact, clinging upside down to the ceiling, and it was only when his tail wrapped protectively around her that she felt safe again. Watching carefully, Spike chose his moment, then unleashed a fully charged blast of electric breath, which slammed full force into the side of the mecha and sending it, and its pilot, flipping end over and to slam into the fire wall as the top burst into flames. Spike, Samus snapped. I said not to assist me. And Adam ordered me to hit any suspicious figure with my electric breath. Spike called back innocently. I'd say a mech designed for transporting crates equipped with lasers and buzzsaws is pretty suspicious. A clang echoed up to Spike, letting him know Samus had smacked her faceplate with her armored hand. He smirked as he heard the woman wrapped in his tail giggle girlishly. Ugh! Twilight groaned as she brought her hoof to her face, despite the laughter around her. Did you ever learn to turn your swag off, whatever that is? Am I going to have to watch out for that woman, whoever she is, showing up as a rival for Gandrata? Wait, what? 
Gandreda demanded, stunned. Mom, seriously, Melissa didn't see me that way, Spike insisted. Just keep telling yourself that, Anthony offered with a wide smirk. Samus rolled her eyes. At any rate, Adam sent orders to change our priority to taking down the creature we know now was Ridley, since the wavelength of its cry was driving all creatures around it into a frenzy. If left unchecked, the creatures within the battleship would take down us and survivors. I told the woman we'd just saved, we didn't get her name just there, since we were in such a rush, to find somewhere safe and secure to hide, and to only open the door if it was me on the other side, Spike explained. Since the deleter android was humanoid, it was logical to assume it could only mimic humans or those with a humanoid structure. Logical and accurate, Adam agreed. So after that, we set course for Sector 3, in pursuit of the creature, Samus continued. Unfortunately, we found our way to a dead end based on the path Adam gave us. When we tried to backtrack us, we found ourselves trapped by more upgraded Zebzians in a glass cage. Our beams bounced off, and the glass was too thick for Spike to smash through without disabling his armor's limiter. Which would have been a bad idea, Spike insisted, since I'd have been able to smash through the walls of the station then, which wouldn't have been safe. And the Zebzians had wave beams, which shot right through the clear walls, Samus finished. As soon as I got that information, I authorized Samus' own wave beam, Adam continued. In addition to letting my beam penetrate transparent or semi-transparent substances, it made it much more powerful, Samus explained. It also opened the path forward, allowing us to actually make our way to Sector 3. If only it were so easy, Spike muttered. Samus activated the elevator control somewhat dubiously as Spike settled himself on the platform. The elevator immediately started shooting up the long lift towards the central elevator. Despite the seeming quiet, Spike paced the platform, his instincts and senses on high alert. Taking that as a cue, Samus scanned their surrounding, ready to fight at a moment's notice. Both turned out to be right, as wave beam equipped enhanced Zebzians dropped onto the platform from above, immediately lunging for the attack. Samus focused on the first of the attacking trio while Spike took the second, knocking the third off the platform behind them with his tail, where it fell far behind them. More wave beam Zebzians continued to drop down as the elevator platform rose, but Spike's strategy of knocking any beyond the two he and Samus were actively focusing on off the elevator, whether down to fall behind or up to be run over as the platform raced up the sloping shaft, continued to prove effective. As the last of the Zebzians were dealt with, another creature swooped down. This creature somewhat resembled an oversized stag beetle with its giant horns, with a narrow body lined with spikes that were either teeth or flight assist fins, it was difficult to determine. It had two long arms ending in red claws, two small legs, and a large eye where its head should have been. It quickly proved to be cybernetic as it unleashed a wave of missiles that locked onto the pair as they dodged around them. As soon as it landed on the platform, Spike closed the clash with the creature, clenching his teeth as he discovered it could match his present level of physical strength. He dug his hind claws into the platform to keep from being pushed back while Samus raced around, taking pot shots at the creature's eye as they became clear, not charging her beam to keep the diffusion effect from injuring Spike. After a time, the creature broke free of the grapple, its eye becoming a red hole as it began drawing in energy for some sort of attack. Samus quickly countered this by firing a missile into the hole, causing the creature to fall back, allowing Spike to charge in and knock it for a loop before Samus jammed her charged arm cannon into the eye and fired. Despite the amassed assault, the creature recovered readily and continued the attack until the platform reached the end of the elevator shaft. It then unleashed a few more attacks to make the pair back off a bit before taking flight, diving down the shaft and away from the pair. Chapter 93, M, Hot on the Trail What the hey was that thing? Applejack demanded worriedly, the description of the beast having made her more than a bit squeamish. We're not entirely sure, Samus admitted. Though it wasn't the last time we saw it. It was obviously another bioweapon of some sort but we weren't able to figure out why it was attacking us when it was. As best we were able to determine, something was in control of every creature made in the battleship, and was directing them to attack anything that wasn't, and Ridley was somehow boosting their aggressiveness far beyond normal levels. It made the trip through Sector 3 rather, 
Interesting, Spike muttered. Not only were all the creatures much more ferocious, they were pumping themselves full of various chemicals that made them taste awful. Between that and far more enhanced Sleevesians, we barely had time and all that heat to breathe. And every time we turned around, one of the larger, harder to kill creatures we'd faced before popped up, Samus added. I couldn't wait to track the beast down and tear it apart. Spike snickered a bit, only to whistle innocently as Samus glared at him. Am I, missing something? Anthony asked, confused. Oh yeah, you weren't there for that fight. Spike replied, grinning. Did you catch it, Adam? I'm afraid not, Adam replied. That's when I made my move. Seeing several confused glances, Spike shrugged. We'll get there soon enough. Before that, though, we actually bumped into Anthony. I remember that. Anthony spoke up. Really saved my bacon, too. Would have wound up extra crispy without you. As Samus and Spike came charging into a large room, they heard a very human scream of frustration. Across the room from them on a much higher platform above a pool of lava, Anthony was desperately trying to fight off the large creature they faced on the way out of Sector 2. His plasma cannon was strapped to his back, still charging, and he was forced to fight off the creature and several others with only his freeze pistol. It quickly became plain he was outgunned when the beetle-like creature unleashed a searing blast of electrical energy that he only barely managed to evade. Anthony! Samus screamed out in terror. Uncle Tony! Spike yelled. Duck! With that warning, he leapt into the air, quickly clearing the gap and landing on the high platform, grappling with the beast. Samus watched carefully, searching for a way to assist. However, a problem quickly became apparent. Without her to assist him, Spike was quickly caught in a pure power struggle, and couldn't spare a glance for anything around him. Spike was now just as much a danger to Anthony as the creature he was fighting. Adam, I need to get up there, she shouted into her comms. There's a grapple point directly above you, Adam responded quickly. Your grapple beam is authorized. Do it, Samus. Immediately activating her grapple beam, Samus locked on and dragged herself to the platform. As she came off the swing, she landed a heavy kick right in the creature's eye, making it rock back. A few quick shots took out its backup, letting her and Anthony move to the back of the platform against the wall, out of danger of being knocked into the lava below. Nice timing, Princess, Anthony greeted, immediately focusing his fire. Less talky, more shooty. Spike barked out as he decked the recovering creature. Got it, ankle biter! Anthony replied jovially, quickly pulling his standard rifle out with his free hand, firing with both as quickly as he could. The combined fire of Anthony's freeze blaster, Samus ice effect with her wave slash diffusion beam, and Spike's own ice breath quickly froze the base of the creature's horns, limiting its combat ability somehow and forcing it to stay grounded. However, its own energy blasts can now be unleashed much more rapidly, and it now attacked with its arms, which stretched out in sweeping strikes. On occasion, Samus attempted leaping onto the monstrosity to inflict additional damage up close, but each time it reared, using its horns to knock her off. Eventually, the red hole appeared and began sucking energy in, and a missile knocked the creature temporarily prone. Dashing in, she unleashed a full charge blast into the eye, and the damage caused the creature's horn base to shatter, leaving it hornless. Rather than disabling it, however, this only seemed to make the creature angrier. It began attacking much more ferociously, as well as unleashing its missiles. After the first volley, however, Spike dashed in close at a small size, delivering a fierce uppercut as he expanded to the creature's size, sending it flipping into the air. Rather than continue the assault, however, the creature fled, diving into the lava. Phew, Anthony gasped in relief lifting his faceplate to get a breath of less recycled air. That was ugly. Thanks princess, ankle biter. So, seen anyone else? No, we haven't, Spike muttered. Were you expecting anyone? Well, I got orders from the commander to meet up with everyone over here to activate the geothermal power plant, Anthony explained. The meetup points a nearby navigation booth, but after waiting for everyone for a while, I decided to take a look around, only to get jumped by those things. 
We're after the creature from Sector 1, Samus explained. It's causing all the other creatures to go nuts, so we're going to put it down before things get any hotter. Well, as long as it's just the three of us, can I ask you something, Samus? Samus paused, turning to face Anthony. Go ahead. 1, it's, I just don't get it, Samus, Anthony finally spoke up. I've heard what you two are capable of, alone and together. Between the two of you with your full arsenal, you could have just brushed right past a lot of us and sought out every survivor, and whatever else you felt needed to be done here, and we couldn't have done thing one to stop you. But instead, you come practically had in hand begging the commander to let you both help. He rubbed the back of his helmet. I get that there's a lot of tension between you two, and stuff I probably don't understand, but why are you still taking orders from him? Samus glanced away, unsure how to explain herself. It's, complicated. Try me, Anthony replied easily, his warm smile showing his fraternal affection for her. Samus searched her mind for the right words. I, respect him, she offered at last. Anthony stared at her for a time. That's it? He asked. That's all you've got for me? All she's willing to share with Adam listening in on an open comms channel, Spike offered, smirking mischievously. Anthony's eyes widened. Whoops! He quickly prepped his weapons. Catch you later, you too! He quickly rushed off on his mission. It's not that funny! Anthony complained as almost everyone listening burst into laughter. Yes it is, Adam countered, smirking slightly. 1. The following conversation is dedicated to the fiery Joker, as it was his rant video with the Autark that was a major inspiration for this entire arc. Thanks for being awesome, Scorcher! Chapter 94, M, Fishing for Answers Once the laughter started to die down, Samus took pity on Anthony's embarrassment and quickly continued the tale. After Anthony headed off on his mission, Spike and I made our way into a new part of the Pyrosphere, the Blast Furnace area. We figured starting somewhere new was better than retreading old ground, as Adam would have informed us if the creature was somewhere we'd already explored. Of course, the actual passage through the blast furnace itself wasn't exactly smooth, Spike explained. Even as we were making our way in, activating grapple points to hover so mom could make her own way through, a giant magma fish leapt out and tried to eat one. Which meant we had to fight it once we made it into the main part of the blast furnace, Samus explained. After opening the path into the blast furnace, Samus used one of the grapple points to swing out over the lava only to have to leap free as the massive magma fish creature leapt out of the lava to try and eat her. She managed to barely leap clear, coming in for a landing on a stone platform after spotting the grapple point it had previously eaten lodged in the back of its throat. Spike quickly joined her on the stone platform. The thermals are too strong for me to fly safely, he grunted, and the fish is too heavily armored for me to meet it in the lava. The only weak point I saw were some engorged nodules on its underbelly but we'll need to make it expose those. Samus quickly rolled to the side as the fish splashed into the lava, launching a sphere of flame towards them. I think I have an idea, she muttered. We just need to get it to open its mouth wide near us. Spike grinned, having seen the grapple point as well. I like fishing, he agreed. Samus kept her grapple beam ready, letting Spike fire at the engorged nodules whenever the fish exposed them in its leaping. Eventually, the fish reared near the edge of the platform with its mouth wide open. Samus locked on and dragged it onto the rocks with her grapple beam. She and Spike then leapt to the attack, Samus using her beam and missiles and Spike digging in with claws and fangs. The gigantic fish, for its part, flopped around madly until it was able to get back into the lava, but it had already taken heavy damage. As it struggled in the magma, Spike dove in after it, going low before coming up underneath it delivering a heavy strike to its vulnerable underbelly with his tail, making it once more rear out of the lava, roaring. Samus once more grappled it out of the magma, letting the pair inflict even more damage. When it came back out of the lava again, it had managed to swallow the grapple point completely, meaning Samus could no longer fish it out, but it had taken enough damage that it didn't take much longer to finish it off, letting the grapple point float back where it belonged as the lava drained out of the chamber. Huh, Applejack muttered. 
Never thought of fishing as an extreme sport before. Guess it all depends on how you do it. Rainbow snickered as the others tittered. Samus chuckled softly, but continued the tale. Not long after, Adam contacted me, informing us that the creature we were after was heading for the geothermal electric power generator, she explained. Since that was where Anthony was headed, we didn't need to be told twice to get after it fast. Even with the map coordinates, it was going to take a while to get there, though, Spike added. Was rather worrisome for us. We didn't want to think about what it would mean if Anthony got there first. And of course, there was always a chance it would be the deleter android pretending to be Anthony when we got there, Samus continued. Plenty of worries for that trip. Thankfully, the path was mostly straightforward, making it easy for us to make it through rapidly. Did you have any trouble along the way? Shining asked curiously. You could say that, Samus confirmed. After a long, winding path upward, Spike and Samus charged into a new chamber, only to have to instantly dive to either side to evade the biomech from before trying to catch them off guard by smashing through a small tower. It immediately moved in to try and take them down, lashing with its arms and firing its missiles. Samus noticed in passing that either it had grown its horns back, or there was more than one of these creatures. Some concentrated fire from Samus and Spike's ice breath froze the base of its horns again, at which point it took to the air. Unlike before, the chamber was big enough for Spike to pursue it in the air, and despite its seeming ability to float, Spike had more aerial combat experience. Before long, the heavy blow knocked it out the open roof of the chamber, sending it tumbling down into the pit below. Spike moved to pursue it, but Samus quickly called out to him. That thing's not our priority. She barked out. Come on. Spike grumbled, but turned back. I don't like leaving it alive to chase us, he complained. We'll get it eventually, Samus assured him. But if we delay too long now, Anthony might pay the price. Right, Spike agreed, his head hanging, feeling ashamed he'd forgotten about that. Samus stroked his muzzle comfortingly. Come on, she ordered. We better hurry. We didn't encounter any other major hurdles, Samus admitted. Unfortunately, what was waiting for us? Samus and Spike both fell silent. 